is a deeper question altogether, which is, what do you desire? What makes you itch? What sort of a situation would you like? Let's suppose, I do this often in vocational guidance of students. They come to me and say, well, uh, we're getting out of college and we haven't the faintest idea what we want to do. So I always ask the question, what would you like to do if money were no object? What, how would you really enjoy spending your life? Well, it's so amazing as a result of our kind of educational system, crowds of students say, well, we'd like to be painters, we'd like to be poets, we'd like to be writers, but as everybody knows, you can't earn any money that way. Or another person says, well, I'd like to live an out-of-doors life and ride horses. I say, do you want to teach in a riding school? Uh, let's go through with it. What do you want to do? When we finally got down to something which the individual says he really wants to do, I will say to him, you do that and uh, forget the money. Uh, because if you say that getting the money is the most important thing, you will spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living, that is to go on doing things you don't like doing, which is stupid. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. And after all, if you do really like what you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is, you can eventually turn it, uh, you could eventually become a master of it. It's the only way to become a master of something, to be really with it. And then you'll be able to get a good fee for whatever it is. So uh, don't, don't worry too much. That, that's, uh, everybody's, uh, somebody's interested in everything. And anything you can be interested in, you'll find others who are. But it's absolutely stupid to spend your time doing things you don't like in order to go on spending things you don't like, doing things you don't like, and to teach your children to follow in the same track. See, what we're doing is we're bringing up children and educating them to live the same sort of lives we're living, in order that the, they may justify themselves and find satisfaction in life by bringing up their children, to bring up their children to do the same thing, so it's all wretch and no vomit. It never gets there. And so, therefore, it's so important to consider this question, what do I desire? Well, when we answer that question in a naive way, we figure out that we want a desire, uh, what we want is to control everything, to create girls that don't grow old, apples that don't rot, clothes that never wear out, conveyances that get from one place to another instantly so we don't have to wait, power available to do anything that you could conceive and do it just instantly like that, to get this funny technological omnipotence. But if you take time out to think about that and really go into it with your full strength of imagination and find out whether that's where you want to be, you will soon see that's not what you want. Because the moment you have a situation where you are really in control of things, that is to say in which the future is almost completely predictable. You will see, as I said last night, that a completely predictable future is already the past. You've had it. And that's not what you wanted. You want a surprise, and you don't know what that's going to be, because obviously it wouldn't be a surprise if you did. You want a pleasant surprise. But like you say, what sort of a surprise would be pleasant? And you can't really answer that. Because you know if there are to be such things as pleasant surprises, there must also be unpleasant surprises. There must be rude shots. So you're like somebody taking a one of those wishing well boxes, you know, tubs, you know, where you fish in and you bring out a package. And you don't know whether you've got a dead rat in it or a new camera. <laughs> and that's the way, that's, that seems to be the thing that really excites people. 
But quite certainly there comes out of this inquiry a feeling of real disillusionment with the ideal of power. To be in power, to be in control, is not something that any sensible person wants. Now you may say that's shirking responsibility. That if you were a really responsible person, you would go out for power and try to use power to the best possible advantage, for the benefit of all. All right, what would be the benefit of all? Ask them, what do you want me to do with this power? I'm dictator. What would you like me to do? Well, nobody knows, because they haven't thought it through. They think of all sorts of short-range things, and they are largely conflicting and confusing, because they're not well thought out. But again, when it finally comes down to it, nobody wants to be God. Now, I think that this is the greatest possible lesson for the Western world to learn, because we are so hung up on the idea of power, of control, of being able to make everything go the right way, and if we've never thought it through. When you get control of it, what are you going to do with it? And so when you think things through like that, you understand you do not want power. You don't want to control everything. And therefore, in the exploration of what you want, you get to the point where having all pleasures at your command, and they pall, and you think of new sources of pleasure. And eventually you get like the ancient Romans, who had all these mad crowds of barbarians, who had to go every Saturday to the Colosseum for a show that really had to surpass everything. Because they had public baths, they had prostitutes, they had every kind of luxury. But when they went to see one of the big shows that people like Nero put on, they would have, for example, floats circling the Colosseum, all full of slave girls from distant parts of the Mediterranean, garlanded with flowers and waving at the crowd and going innocently around. And the next minute they would release wild lions into the arena to eat up all the slave girls. And they got a big sadistic kick out of that. Because, you see, pursuing pleasure beyond a certain place takes you into what the Buddhists call the Naraka world, that is to say the hells. When you have explored pleasure to its ultimate limit, the only thing you can get a kick out of is pain. And so naturally, you descend from the Deva world at the top of the wheel to the Naraka world at the bottom, where it shows all these beings in, in states of torture. You get to the hell world as a result of not knowing what you want. As a result of thoughtless pursuit of pleasure, which ends you eventually in the pursuit of pain. So when you're in the hell world, that's where you want to be. So when I ask, I go right down to the question, which we started with, what do I want? The answer is, I don't know. When Bodhidharma was asked, who are you? Which is another form of the same question. He said, I don't know. Planting flowers to which the butterflies come. Bodhidharma says, I know not. I don't know what I want. Well, when you don't know what you want, you've re reached the state of desirelessness. When you really don't know. But you see, there's a, there's a beginning stage of not knowing and there's an ending stage of not knowing. In the beginning stage, you don't know what you want because you haven't thought about it or you've only thought superficially. And then when you, somebody forces you to think about it and go through and say, yeah, I think I'd like this, I think I'd like that, I think I'd like the other, that's the middle stage. And then you get beyond that. Say, is that what I really want? In the end you say, no, I don't think that's it. I might be satisfied with it for a while and I wouldn't turn my nose up at it, but it's not really what I want. Why don't you really know what you want? Two reasons that you don't really know what you want. Number one, 
you have it. Number two, you don't know yourself because you never can. The Godhead is never an object of its own knowledge. Just as a knife doesn't cut itself, fire doesn't burn itself, light doesn't illumine itself. It's always an endless mystery to itself. I don't know. And this I don't know, uttered in the infinite interior of the spirit, this I don't know is the same thing as I love, I let go, I don't try to force or control. It's the same thing as humility. Any time you, as it were, voluntarily let up control, in other words, cease to cling to yourself, you have an access of power. Because you're wasting energy all the time in self-defense trying to manage things, trying to force things to conform to your will. The moment you stop doing that, that wasted energy is available. And therefore, you are, in that sense, having that energy available, you are one with the divine principle. You have the energy. When you're trying, however, to act as if you were God, that is to say, you don't trust anybody and you're the dictator and you have to keep everybody in line, you lose the divine energy. Because what you're doing is simply defending yourself. So then, the principle is, the more you give it away, the more it comes back. <laughs>